Good. Hi, this is Stu here for Love Yoga Anatomy, and I'm really excited today because I'm here with Simon Borg Olivier. And I've been hearing about him for years and years and years, and here I am with the legend himself. So we're going to have a great chat about um, everything from anatomy to the way that he envisages yoga now and the way that he implements it in the type of sequences he puts together. So, Simon, I wanted to ask you first of all, I was lucky enough to catch the end of your class the other day. And there seems to be a lot of, um, I would call it spine undulation, uh, you know, like snake-like movement. So yes. obviously there's a, a reason for that. Yes. So can you, can you en enlighten us to, to the, the way your yoga is going at the moment? Obviously it's evolved, I imagine, from, from where it yeah. started. You know, if you read the old texts, the Hatha Yoga texts, yeah. it talks about Shiva giving us the postures. And he said there are eight, there are 84 lakh postures. Right. So it, a lakh is 100,000. So it means he says there is 8,400,000 postures. Right. And we go, right, that's a lot of postures. And, you know, you might sort of imagine that's just a Indian exaggeration, Fictional. perhaps. <laughs> Fictional exaggeration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when you work it out mathematically and you go, what do the main joints do? And look at something like the ankles, the knees, elbows and wrists, they yeah. mainly go forward and backward. It's just a hinge joint, not complete hinge joint, but that's pretty much what they do. Mm -hmm. Whereas the hips, the shoulders and the spine have got three main movements. So shoulders can go forward and backward, out to the side and in, and turn in, turn out, same as the hips. And the spine bends forward and backward, side to side, turns, twists. So if you work out using very simple maths, right. How many possible positions can the body do? It's actually, you know, two to the power of one ankle, two ankle, one knee, other yes, knee. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And so it works out two to the power of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Two to the power of 23 is the official mathematical description of how many postures the body can do. And it turns out to be 8,400,606. Yeah. It's, you know, to a very good approximation yeah, of yeah. 84 lakh. Wow. And you go, well, that's interesting. But really, that's taking into account that the spine is just one unit, bends mm -hmm. forward and backward. But if you take into account that the spine is actually... 24 mobile segments right and you go how many postures could you do if you included 24 mobile joints of the spine then the number that you work out comes to more like 7 billion right and that's a lot of postures so if we work with the thesis that you get good at what you practice then if you want to really get good at everything you've got to do all the poses but how on earth are you going to do all the poses? <laughs> Even once. Even in once a yeah. in a lifetime. Unless you move a fair bit. So although static practice has its benefits and its use, for most people I don't find it effective. And I find that, I believe that the, um, the yoga inside a person's body on a physical level is really exemplified and made real on a physical level by the movement and the circulation of energy and information through the body, and energy we can call prana, information, right. chitta, but that essentially amounts to something as simple as getting blood to move through your arteries and veins. And if you want to get, once you get the circulation happening, then you feel in yoga. Your body starts to feel connected. It's yeah. also electrochemical um, movement of nerve energy and, and the movement of hormones and neurotransmitters through yeah. the nadis and subtle channels. But it's improving circulation of energy information that makes yoga. And that is possible to be done in a completely static position. Like an adept and advanced yogi can sit in a very passive posture, yeah. naked in the snow, and generate heat. Yes, yes. But it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to try it. No, I wouldn't want to try it. <laughs> so a more easy accessible form for the normal modern body yeah. is you move their body. And while moving their body, that helps them move energy and information. But it's much more advanced to be in any static position and move energy and information. Right. So I'm, I'm more in favor of getting people who tend to sit for 50, 5 to 15 hours a day, yeah. get off their chairs, get off their mats, stop being still, actually move a little bit. Another, another reason why I get them to move is that if you've got between 88 million and 7 billion postures to get through just so your body goes through its range of movement, yeah. 
how can you do that with static postures? You can't hold. Time or yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Mm. So you move. So systematically, I move them by undulating the spine. So moving the spine is very, very good because a lot of people have the impression, and this perhaps comes from physiotherapy. I'm an Australian-based physiotherapist. As well as other stuff, I understand. As yeah. well, looking at your bio, what were the other things just to know? Oh, is there look, nutrition I, stuff? I, I've done nutrition stuff and yeah. biochemical stuff, and, yeah. I, and I've got a degree in, in molecular biology as well. So <laughs> it's, it's 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 fairly scientific, and my head yeah. works that way a little yeah. bit. But I've had these two divisions in my life: the science and the yoga, and I, I like to bring them. Try as and well. bring them together. It's, and I, so I, this is how the spine. So how is the spine coming in? Sorry, I well, was interrupting no, it's okay. you. The spine is like. If you, if you look at the world of modern yoga, a lot of people are very fixed on the idea of neutral spine. Yes. And a lot of people um, will also talk about holding the core firm. And the way many people hold the core firm is by actually using the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation. Right. And the muscles of forced abdominal exp uh, exhalation are the oblique muscles. And the oblique muscles, if you use like one oblique here, one oblique there, these muscles, when they tense unilaterally on one side only, will make you twist. Mm -hmm. So the right external oblique makes you twist to left, left, left one makes you twist to right. But if you tighten left and right at the same time, mm -hmm. that will make you exhale fully and it prevents you twisting left or right because you try to twist to both sides at once. So essentially, the muscles that most people use to firm their core are also muscles that immobilize the spine. Right. And so the way most people practice in the world is with the mental conception that their spine should stay neutral and the physical actions, the muscular actions, which actually lock their spine. Right. So this to me is a little bit as ineffective or even perhaps crazy okay. as saying to you, you've just broken your ankle or you've sprained your ankle. We're going to bandage it up. Uh -huh. And we're going to keep the bandage on because you've got an injury and we don't want you moving your ankle because it will hurt. Mm -hmm. So we put the bandage on, bandage prevents movement, and we say, keep that on. How long? Forever! Right. Let's keep the bandage on forever. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. Yeah. And that's a bit like what they're doing with the spine. They're saying, you've maybe, not even definitely, got a back pain. Mm -hmm. So we're going to tie your back up with a muscular bandage to prevent it moving, and it's never going to move again. Right. And that's insane. Yeah. Because the spine is really important to move. And freedom of movement of the spine is the essence of essential health, both on a musculoskeletal basis and also on a physiological basis. Your internal organs are freer to move if your spine moves. They work better. Digestion works better. And if you have to ask someone who comes to their first yoga class, you know, or rather someone who you might say, would you like to come to yoga? They, they say no. You say why? A common answer is, I can't even touch my toes. Yes. Yep. Perception yes. is yeah. that hamstring flexibility is important. Prerequisite. Prerequisite, mm. no? But then sometimes you get them coming to the class and they discover that suddenly they've got to have strength in their arms. And they go, oh, actually, arms are important. And if you say to someone, if I had to, God forbid, <laughs> chop off your arms or your legs, which would you rather keep the most, oh. arms or legs? And legs. the decision is, well, <laughs> decision is difficult. Arms, legs, I don't know. But if you say, look, we've got to chop off something, either your arms or your legs or your spine, mm. which would you rather keep the longest? Mm -hmm. The spine is important. Yes. And so my, my belief is that we need to pay a lot more attention to the health of the spine. Move it like it naturally moves as a baby. Move it the way animals move it, the way, I mean, we talk about up dog, down dog. You see the dogs, every Beautiful vertebrae voice, moves. Yeah. Cats. And the cats. Yes, every vertebrae. <laughs> yeah. Most adults are 95% yeah. paralyzed in their spine. Yeah. So, I mean, we talk about Kundalini, but no one moves the spine. Yeah. So the spine to me is very, very, very important. And a lot of imbalance in the modern world of yoga, because everyone talks about folding forward at the hips, mm. drawing the navel to the spine, opening the heart center, pull the shoulders back and down. And one of the first comments I get when people come to my class for the first time yeah. is they say, we do enough of that in everyday life, mm. in the modern world. Mm. So maybe for most of the practice, work on folding forward less at the hips, move the navel away from the spine, move the ribs in to close the chest from the front, but open it from the back, and move the shoulders forward and up. Yeah. And people go, that's, that's <laughs> heresy. Yes, it's insane. Yeah. Yet, if you do a posture like, say, for example, Lolasana, right. which is the posture that in Ashtanga Vinyasa you do twice for every up dog, down dog. Mm -hmm. you lift. lift up in the mm -hmm. air. You know, it's a lift up in the mm -hmm. air. And actually, 
it's the pose that you're meant to really learn before doing the push-up position, Chaturanga Dandasana and Chatwari. So Patabi Joyce was very strict, wasn't he? He used to say, you can't do pose 49 until you master pose 48. Right. And he would keep some of us back for six months, going, oh, I'm stuck on, on Marichasana C, I can't do Marichasana yeah. D until I finish C, this sort of stuff. Yeah. And so the you know, understanding is you have to master pose 7 before master 8, mm. which also might suggest then you have to master pose 3 before you get to pose 4. Yeah. And if we go ekam arms up, that's pose one. Dve hands to the floor, uttanasana pose two. Trini, lift up the head, is not just lift up the head, because the fourth one, chatvari, is the push up. Mm. So lifting up the head also means lifting up the legs off the floor. Mm. It's a half handstand, it's lolasan. Mm. Mm. Now that posture, if you try and do it with your tummy pulled in, your chest open, fold at the hips and pull the shoulders back, you cannot lift up. And you see anyone who lifts up effortlessly will actually round the back, yeah. shoulders go forward, the back lengthens, the front firms, and it's all about rectus abdominis strength, and the ribs are in from the front, and I think this posture defines Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha the way Patabi Joyce wanted it. Yeah. And when you do that then, it's all about the spine, and it's also about diaphragmatic breathing. I suppose a, few, a lot of people are afraid that this is what they do all day at the office, or they feel that this is what they do at the office, and yes. so they do we need more of that? But I mean, I, when I'm watching you in the practice, there is this, but then there's also that. Both, exactly. There? So it's the whole thing yes, is going. Yes, you have to do both. Mm. And often when people will say at the end of a practice, they come to me, they're saying, all we're ever doing is this. Yeah. And I go, no, you're not watching like you watch. Yeah. You know, I'm doing this, then I'm doing that. But mm. whenever I move backwards, that's mm. normal for them. Mm. So they don't think it's anything special, yeah. but they're unused to moving forward. Yeah. But actually, you do need to move, move both forward and backward. Now, if a person is stuck in an office all day, yeah. and they're sort of stuck like this, yeah. invariably, when they stand up, their back is, uh, their hips are very stiff. Mm -hmm. So they're actually very tight in the front of the hips. And uh, uh, like an old people, you see an old person stand up, they're sort of hunched over Leaning when they forward. stand up. Yep. Yeah. So then to stand up straight, they have to sort of lift up their chest. Mm. And that lifting up the chest, and even pulling the shoulders back, is not going to fix up their curved forward spine. Mm. All it does is it makes them hinge around L5-S1 mm. and actually pinch their lower back more. Mm. And this person rarely, although they might have appearing a bit of a hunchback, they're not going to usually have pain in their upper back. Yeah. The pain is in the lower back. Where well, they're accommodating it. They're accommodating mm. it, yeah. Mm. So if you actually tell a person like that round the back forward, they actually feel better. Right. <laughs> and then what you have to learn to do is keep the lower back lengthened yeah. and start to open the front of the hips and the front of the chest without compromising by bending at L5-S1. Yeah. Most people overbend at L5-S1 and they're, they're stuck in a back bend at L5-S1. Yeah. Most normal adults. Yeah. And uh, you were saying something else very interesting in, in so far is that that forward bend of the spine and the thoracic area is initiated, from what I understood, by the shoulder blades moving forwards. Is that, is that how I picked it up? Uh, th that's, that's a good observation, but um, when you bring your shoulder blades forward, mm. it makes your spine bend forward. Mm. But the natural body works by moving from the core. So it's not lock the core, but it's move from the core. So if I bend my lumbar spine forward, yeah. and then bend my shoulders forward, that feels very different to taking my shoulders and putting them forward. Like yeah. if I could, can I hold yeah, your yeah, shoulders? Yeah, if I hold your shoulders and yeah. pull them forward, yeah. it's going to make you bend forward. Yeah. So if you do that, if you bring your shoulders forward, it makes your body bend forward. Yeah. So it's your shoulders pulling your trunk. Yeah. But if you sit up and then just keep the hips still, yeah. move the belly button forward, then the chest, then move the shoulders forward, that yeah. feels different. Yeah. And that's the, way the, that's the way the natural body works. Yeah. And this comes from research in the 19... 80s, which was published by Australian physiotherapists, right. that said that if you have, say, for example, a heavy object, yeah. like imagine this is a, a couple a, of... You know, a gold bar, maybe. A gold bar, like <laughs> this. And so the, the physiotherapist in Australia found yeah. out that a healthy person and, and, and a person with bad back right. did the same things when they picked up a heavy object, but they did it in a different firing order. So a healthy person would think, I want to pick up heavy object, yeah. brain thinks. Second thing is their lower abdominal region becomes active. Yeah. Third thing, they reach with their hand to pick it up. Hmm? Head, lower abdomen, hand. Person with bad back may not have stronger or weaker abdomen. Mm -hmm. It's to do with firing order. They will go, 
I want to pick up heavy object, their hand moves, then their core moves. So what the physiotherapist of the 1980s in Australia just pr pr proposed was that if you get a person who's got a bad back and you make them activate their core first before moving their hand, right. the back problem goes away. Right. And this research went all around the world and they said to activate a person's core, you consider the muscles they're trying to activate are the transversus abdominis, right. which are these belt muscles that yeah. go around here. And they wanted specifically the lower abdomen muscles. So they s told everyone, draw the navel toward the spine, that will engage the lower abdomen, and then, then move your arm to pick up the object. In theory, it was a good theory. It went all around the world. Mm -hmm. You hear it still, draw it's the navel still to the there, spine, yeah. it's still there. Australian physiotherapists stopped saying it about 15 years ago mm -hmm. because they found with real-time ultrasound that when they said to people, draw the navel to the spine, actually, most people use four or five other methods than the one that they wanted. Okay. So some people draw the navel to the spine using the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation, yeah. which lock the spine, inhibit the transverse abdominis, inhibit the diaphragm, and actually cause stress. Other people only draw the navel to the spine by expanding the chest. Right. Other people do a combination of both. And very few people, like really one in 20, is able to do the engagement of the lower abdomen without affecting the upper abdomen. Right. So for example, if you get the average person who wants to try it, you put your fingers in your abdomen, relax the abdomen fully. Yeah. And with the abdomen fully soft, yeah. now pull the lower abdomen inwards. And can you draw the lower abdomen in, like this is my lower abdomen going in, while keeping the upper abdomen just as soft? 19 out of 20 people will say, no, I can't. Yeah. As soon as the lower goes in, upper becomes yes. tense, Same. which means then it's not lower abdomen, it's the, mm. it's the oblique muscles. Mm. And those muscles will usually cause an inhibition of the diaphragm, which means you cannot breathe in a relaxed way, right. you cannot move your spine, and with the diaphragm inhibited, you tend to enter a state of sympathetic nervous system dominance, which mm. is essentially a state of flight or fight. So physiologically, the body is thinking, I'm under threat. I'm either going to have to fight something or run away. And the dominant emotions become then fear, anger, and aggression, yeah. and lack of safety, and doesn't sound like yoga. <laughs> no. And in terms of a healthy body, yeah. you switch off your digestive system, immune system, and reproductive system, or to just draw the navel to the spine in a way which doesn't really do what the physiotherapist was saying. Right. So the physiotherapist in Australia stopped saying this in the early 2000s, but, and even Pilates instructors don't say it in Australia anymore, mm -hmm. very few. But as I travel around the world, those instructions went all around the world, and it's still 80% of people are talking yeah. about drawing the navel to the spine. Yeah. But I've got a, a video, which I think you've seen, yes. where I'm showing it, and there's like yeah. four different ways you can pull the belly in. Yeah, maybe we'll main. link that as well. Yes. We'll link this at the bottom of this interview, so, so you can see that as well. Yeah. Yes, so, so yeah. I've got four main ways I can show it, bring the navel mm. to the spine. Two of them make the abdomen go hard, two of them keep the abdomen fully soft. Mm. And of the two that make the abdomen go hard, one appears to make the tummy to go in, one appears to make the tummy push out. But only if you feel from the inside. On the outside, they all appear to pull the tummy in. Yeah. So if you say to someone, draw the navel to the spine, if I'm just looking at yeah. you or you're looking at me, yeah. I could show it in four different ways, but on the inside, they all feel different. Yeah. And so if you tell that to someone, draw your navel to the spine, you can expect at least four different responses, but some people overlap the two, you know, so you can get six or eight different types of yeah. draw the navel to the spine, all with different results. Yeah. So what should they be doing? Well, the most important thing is not harden the core, it's move from the core. Right. So that if you say, for example, bend your spine forward, if you do yeah. a forward bend, yeah. if you have the perception of keep the neutral spine, when you bend forward then, most of the movements come from the hips. Yeah. And then that, that means that the forward bend is all taken by the hip joints. Yeah. And so if you bend forward with your spine and initiate the movement from your region around L4, L5, then when you bend forward, you've got 24 joints which could all bend forward yeah. and, the sp and the hips become a 25th. Yeah. And so then, instead of placing 100% emphasis on bending at the hips, you place 125th emphasis on the hips, mm. which means less hip injuries. This, uh, but then may mm. maybe people will think, well, we want more at the hip because then there's less in the spine, which means there's maybe less pressure on that vulnerable yes, lumbar yes. area. So mm -hmm. That's right, because, yeah. because there is this story that says that mm. when you bend forward, it is potentially dangerous mm. 
to bend the spine forward. Yeah. That's the common thought. If it's loaded. Is that what yes. Yeah. If it's loaded, or and lo loaded means either carrying weight mm. or being stretched by the hamstrings. Mm. So actually, if you get someone to stand and just simply round the back like this, yeah. which is obviously bending the spine forward, yeah. maybe one in 50 people will feel discomfort. Mm -hmm. If you get someone to bend backward like this, and you actually get them to lift their tailbone up, pull the shoulders back and down, nine out of 10 feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Now, this is partly related to the idea that you can either do a back bend by lengthening the front of the body, or you can do a back bend shape by shortening the back of the body. Yes. Most people are comfortable creating a back bend shape by lengthening the front, but if you consciously say to someone, shorten the back by lifting the tailbone and pulling the shoulders back and down, yes. especially in standing, nine out of 10 people feel discomfort. Yeah. But almost no one feels discomfort from standing if you do this. Yeah. But if you do a forward bend like I'm doing now, while your hamstrings are being stretched, yeah. it invites disaster. Because as you said, right. it's under load. Yeah. So the simple thing is, do not stretch the hamstrings while stretching the spine, the back of the spine at the same time. Right. And the simplest way to do that is like what Desika Char did, and he would mostly say that when people do forward bends, until the head touches really easily on the knee without pulling, yes. then keep the knee bent. Okay, so, so in our Peshimotanasas, Janusha Shasanas, yes. then bend the knee to take the strain off the hamstring. Yes. And until you strain on the spine then, yeah. yeah. And so then you would be slightly rounding, this, curving yes. the spine? Yes, okay. And if you look at most of the um, photographs yeah. by Krishnamacharya and all the people who worked with him, almost all the forward bends were straight legs, spine fully bent. Right. Like Harlasan. Yeah. But then the modern approach is straight legs, straight spine. Yeah. And Iyengar taught that as well. He would have people with straight legs straight for Paschimottanasana yeah. and a belt. Yeah. Because that's safe. It's safe to stretch the back of the legs while keeping the spine straight. Yeah. And it's safe to stretch the back of the spine while keeping the knees bent. bent. But if you are experiencing stretch in the back of the leg and some sort of stretch in the back of the yeah. spine, that's dangerous. That's our loading. That's why people have said, don't yeah. bend forward. Yeah. But if you're a person who's so flexible that you can bend forward and touch your head to your knee without using your hands, mm -hmm then it's not a stretch, it's yeah. just a movement. Yeah. So, you know, if a beginner sees me with my head on my knee in a forward bend, yeah. they say, oh, that looks like a strong hamstring stretch. You yeah. go, no, no, I'm just resting my head on the knee. And yeah. you can lift up your hands and yeah. the head just rests there. Yeah. That's not a stretch. It's like for us, if we cross our arms, mm -hmm. this is not a stretch. Mm -hmm. But if someone does lotus position, they can't do it like this usually. No. Very few people can do lotus like this. Yeah. But if you have to use your hands to pull your legs into lotus, it causes stretch reflexes, which makes the muscles tense while they're lengthened. And that tension plus length in a muscle, we experience as stretch, but actually it's a tense, lengthened muscle. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a way basically of coming one step closer to an injury. Because a muscle which feels like a stretch, when you move it into a position, is one step closer to a muscle that's in pain, which is one step closer to an injured muscle. So are you saying we need to work in that uh, uh, that uh, sphere of very subtle movement, not feeling any stretch at all? More and more, right. I feel that yoga is the place, yeah. physical yoga, yeah. is the place where you don't feel like you're stretching, don't feel like you're tensing, don't feel like you're breathing, don't feel like you're thinking. And if you do feel a stretch or tension, don't call it wrong, yeah. but maybe don't call it yoga. Right. Because a stretch is a little bit like Imagine a garden hose which transmits water through it. As soon as you fold the garden hose in half, you get a good stretch on one side of the hose, yeah. but the water doesn't flow. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Or you can have a garden hose and you can stand on it mm. and wonder why the water doesn't flow mm. because you're squashing it, which is a little bit like a tight muscle. Tense muscles stop blood flow. Anything more than 15 to 20% of maximum tension will stop blood flow. Anything where you experience a stretch will stop blood flow. And I've got lovely photographs, which maybe at some point I can share with yeah, you, great. of infrared camera analysis of different postures. Cool. And you can see how the different movements will inhibit blood flow. Yeah. So whenever you experience a stretch, that stops blood flow. So I, I, I know because we're running short of time, so I've got to get a few more questions yes, in. Yes. It's all related to this, because the next thing that people will say that are watching this is like, okay, We've seen you doing some pretty crazy postures, you know, some really complicated postures that need massive ranges of motion around the different joints. Yes, yeah. So can we get those increases in the range of motion at the different joints by working in such a subtle way? Or how well, did you get okay. them? The, the, the most 
I, I think in the beginning, I think I cheated. I think right. I wasn't doing yoga. Okay. I was doing stretching exercises. Okay. And I was doing tension exercises, mm. the same way a contortionist might do. Yeah. And I think many physical yoga practitioners in the world today are doing stretching exercises and tensing exercises yeah. like contortionists do, like circus people do, which may make them more flexible, mm -hmm. may increase range of movement, but will not necessarily help blood flow or help the circulation of energy and information through the body yeah. and may compromise the physiology of the body by working just on the anatomy. We won't call it wrong, but what do you want? To be a flexible circus gymnast yeah. or do you want to do yoga? Because right. the ultimate state of yoga in a state of meditation, for example, is a state where it doesn't feel like stretching, doesn't feel like tensing, doesn't feel like breathing, doesn't feel like thinking. And yet most people will come to practice and they'll basically look for stretch, tension, <laughs> more breathing, more <laughs> all normal. Those things. Yeah, exactly. and, oh, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I give my students the idea, tense less, stretch less, breathe less, think right. less, but do more. Yeah. And the way you do more is very quickly, it would be done in the way of traditional yoga. So traditional yoga does not start for a lotus position by taking the leg grabbing it with the hand, yeah. putting, pulling it in your leg like this. Because yeah. this is the will of the head and the hands pulling the leg to a place it doesn't want to go. Uh -huh. And the result is a stretch reflex. Yeah. That stretch reflex actually blocks the flow of energy. So I would teach my students to come into postures primarily using active movements. So taking their own leg and moving yes. it into position. Bring the leg in position yeah. as far as it'll go. Yeah. And then by choice, I would say that's enough. Okay. But if they want to do a physical posture that looks more fancy, then take the hand and help. Okay. But don't pick the leg off from the floor. The floor. With yeah. Yeah, yeah. In other words, initiate every movement actively yeah. in the same way that traditional yogis would do. Right. So a traditional yogi, and you've probably seen them like I have, mm. they happily sit like this yeah. with their palms together and one leg will come behind their head. <laughs> yeah. Other leg comes behind their head. Mm. Even I stopped doing Kandasana yes. the day I saw this Himalayan yogi sit up and put his feet in Kandasana while his palms were together. Holy God, yeah. And I go, I think I'm forcing it. <laughs> but really, you know, if we had to, we cross our arms yeah. naturally. Yeah. This is a lotus. So we can do that. Yeah, yeah. But that, yeah it's not happening. But right. some of it's motor control, isn't it? Yes. Some of it is. Yes, yeah. it's true. But imagine if you were to do this and go, oh, that's a strong stretch of my elbow. Mm. Mm. Something's wrong with your elbow. Mm. You yeah. know, like, but actually the elbow is being lengthened as soon as you do that. Mm. But because it's natural, it doesn't feel like a stretch. It just mm. feels like a movement. Yeah. But imagine if we felt a stretch doing Every that. Time we Something's wrong with your elbow. Yeah. Or imagine, like when I bend my elbow, the biceps comes on. Yeah. But it doesn't feel tense. Yeah. But if you go, oh, that's a strong biceps workout yeah. when you do that, something's wrong with your elbow. And same with breathing. The more you breathe in a practice, the less fit you are. So fit people run fast yeah. and hardly breathe at all. Unfit people walk slowly and pant. Uh -huh. So a person who does not much exercise, like a tricky position, like triangle position, yeah. and just going, yeah. then that's not a hard posture. So why breathe a lot? So we're saying now, yeah, so we're saying, do to translate it for any of you guys, is like, do you need a full ujjayi, full yogic breath when you're doing simple postures? You don't that, need five so liters of lungs. Yeah. yeah, you can still, it's, it's a slightly um, more complex qu question and answer, yeah. but essentially the less you breathe doing a particular activity in the world of fitness, yeah. that defines fitness. Yeah. A person who breathes hardly at all while running really fast is yeah. called fit. Yeah. But a person who's doing a very gentle physical exercise, yeah. like standing with one leg wide, one hand up, yeah. and breathes a lot, would yeah. be called an unfit person. Yeah. So if you want fitness, maybe breathe less. Yeah. But what we're doing in the world of yoga is pretending to be an injured, unfit person Right. in many yoga circles uh -huh. by mimicking injured states of where you feel stretch and tension yeah. and over-breathe. Yeah. Are we using the breath though as more of a, a meter and more of a, uh, occupying the mind rather than we need the air that's coming in for what we're doing? You, we're you using it more maybe as, as a, a meditative tool? Yeah, yes, exactly. you could. Okay, and I, I could ask you to do this, yeah. and anyone who's listening can do this as yeah. well. If I ask you to sit up straight mm -hmm. and just relax, yeah. and you just sit up straight, relax totally. And while relaxing totally, we'll relax your tummy, relax the pelvic floor, drop the shoulders, and the main focus will be lengthen and relax. And just lengthen and relax your pelvic floor, drop the hips. Relax the abdomen like a baby's belly. Relax the shoulders. Relax the neck, the jaw, the face, the eyes. And if you listen to the sounds outside the room, 
you hear the sound of birds, cars, and see if you can make a picture mentally of what's going on around us, listening to that sound. Become aware of what's going on outside the room. And then after doing that for a period of time, now draw your attention to your own natural breathing and observe your own natural breathing. And if you like, you can observe the sound of your own natural breathing. And then, I'll ask you to open your eyes and staying relaxed, lift up your shoulders, lift up your elbows, lift up the arms as high as you can bring them and then bring down your arms, put your hands on your knees and take a little breath in and a little breath out. A little breath in and a little breath out. Now that was four different pranayamas. Mm -hmm. Now if pranayama is the art of perhaps learning how to breathe as little as possible, like we think of easy pranayama yeah. is take five full breaths in one minute. Right. Most people can do that. Yeah. But more difficult is one breath in five minutes. Right. So the less you breathe, the harder the pranayama. Yeah. So in that case, the first pranayama you did, when I said listen to the sounds outside the room and just relax, yeah. you hardly breathed at all. Yeah, very shallow. Very yeah. shallow. And yeah. you're like, but as soon as I said become aware of your breath, yeah. watch your breath, listen to the sound of your natural breath, already then you started breathing more. Yeah, you start influencing it yes, yourself, don't you? just yeah. by watching it. Yeah, yeah. And you breathe more. Yeah. And then when I said lift up the arms, you took a bigger breath. Mm. But when I said take a little breath in, your little breath was bigger than all the breaths you've done so far. <laughs> right. And that's a typical response. Right. It's actually very hard for us to observe our breath and not increase it. Yeah. It's not wrong, it's just advanced. Yeah. So most people when they uh, use breathing as a meditative tool, will actually go away from meditation and actually overstimulate their nervous system. Because the less you breathe, the calmer the nerves. The more you breathe, the more the nerves get hypersensitive. And in terms of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, for mm. example, if you practice according to what Guruji said, yeah. and he practiced his sequence with Drishti, yeah. with uh, Ujjayi, Breath, and with, yeah. uh, and with uh, Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha, yeah. as defined by the postures in his sequence, particularly Lolasana, then what you get is a situation where the chest is fairly compressed, the abdomen is firm but pushing outwards, not inwards, and the inhalation and exhalation can start diaphragmatically, but it feels like when you breathe in, only a very small amount of air comes in or out. Right. But if you don't have the bundas correct, or you use the wrong bundas, you will take a lot of air in and out. Right. But you notice that people who begin Ashtanga Yoga, who don't know about breath, get told by intermediate students to breathe more, yeah. but all the advanced students, you can't hear them breathe, you can't see them breathe. Because they're the advanced Ashtangis around the world, almost all the, what that I know, as, as the years go on, start to understand what Bandha and Drishti means, and it basically makes your lungs very, very small and restricts the amount of air that will come in and out of you. Then Ujjayi becomes invisible, inaudible breath. Okay. It's interesting to see, and we could, yeah. we could do it another time to show it. Yeah, but for sure. very sim simply, Lolasan, the yeah. pose you're supposed to do twice for every up dog, dog yes, down dog, yes. and learn third before doing a push up yeah. or up dog, that's a little bit like doing a half sit up, yeah. upside down. So a person can test this. They can sit up and take a slow, full breath in, and without sucking too hard, feel how much air comes in, and you can measure subjectively. And if you do exactly the same breath with the same suction while lying in a half sit up. So you lie on your back, half sit up, lift your hips up, lift your shoulders off the floor, and your rectus abdominis will firm and your ribs will stay in, which is what Lolasan would do. Mm -hmm. And if you make the same suction of air, hardly any air comes in. And that's what would happen if you did Lolasan even more. Like but most people practicing vinyasa yoga, even ashtanga vinyasa yoga, yeah. who do up dog, down dogs, skip lolasana entirely. <laughs> but it's actually yeah. it's the most important pose to define bandha, drishti, and ujjayi pranayam. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, I know you've got to teach because we, oh, we've interrupted Simon. He's here on a teacher training, and so I've just grabbed him between classes. So 
you're going to give us a demo, aren't you, as I well? I can, if so you like. So if we press you, yeah, exactly. So you'll be able to see Simon in work and see the sort of flowing movements that we're talking about. So you'll really enjoy it. And I'm going to put some links on the bottom so you can find out more. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to meet you in person and talk yeah. to you finally after all these years. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Bless you. Thank you very much.